my name is Damian Hansen. I'm a principal software engineer uh, with Solo. Uh, I have been a contributor to Cilium for about a year now, uh, uh, and uh, I'm also a reviewer of a couple of the SIGs uh, within Cilium. Uh, and pretty interesting to come full circle talking about IPv6. Um, I was part of a team uh, that brought IPv6 uh, alpha support to Kubernetes. And IPv6 is probably not the best uh, topic to discuss via slides. Um, and so I put together a, a, a demo that I'm hosting the instructions on GitHub. If you'd like to follow along or maybe access the demo later if you want to grab that QR code. And what we'll do is, is dive uh, right into the demo. Give me one second here. out of here. And if you got the QR code, this is uh, the demo that, um, that you're going to be seeing. So what we're going to be demoing here is um, IPv6 uh, capabilities of Cilium running on a Kubernetes cluster uh, that is configured for IPv6 only. Um, I'm using Kind to spin up the cluster, and it's a simple cluster, two node cluster of a control plane and a uh, control plane node and a worker node. Um, and let's take a look at what we got going on here. So I've uh, installed the cluster, and if we do, uh, sorry here, if we look at the control plane uh, configuration for the Kube Manager, um, you'll see that the cluster cider is defined, and it's using a slash fifty six IPv six cider. And the service cluster IP range is also defined as a V6, as a slash 112. Um, and what we're going to see here is, if we go down, is that nodes are assigned pod sliders. So here's my control plane node that's been assigned a pod, a pod slider of a slash 64. And same with the worker node that come from the slash 56 cluster cider. And what Cilium IPAM will do when I install Cilium, uh, Cilium IPAM will be assigning IPv6 addresses to pods that get scheduled to each of these nodes uh, from each of these pod ciders. And let's take a look at the nodes as well. And you'll see that the nodes are configured for IPv6 as well. Right? So we've got the, the, the colon colon two node and the colon colon three node. And if we do a uh, Docker network, you'll see that since these aren't physical nodes, these are virtual nodes. So essentially each node is a container running on uh, my Docker daemon. And Kind created this Docker network called Kind Cilium and gave it this V6 subnet. And each node here gets assigned an IP from that subnet. So now that we have confirmed the settings for our cluster, let's go ahead and install Cilium. And let's wait for Cilium to be ready. And while we're waiting for Cilium to be ready, uh, let's cover some of the configuration that you see here uh, in the demo. Uh, most of the configuration, I think, is uh, fairly self-explanatory. But there are a few uh, configuration knobs here that uh, I think it's worth covering. So routing mode. Uh, by default, Cilium uses uh, tunnel routing mode. Right? So um, each node creates um, a, a tunnel overlay to other nodes, and that's how pods are able to communicate uh, to each other across the nodes. Um, in this instance, we're not using tunnel mode. We're using native mode. And instead of creating and managing those tunnels, uh, Cilium will go ahead and manage the host's routing table. And I'm going to show you here in just a minute what I'm talking about uh, in more detail. Uh, the auto direct node routes, uh, when these nodes share a common subnet, 
um, uh, Cilium has the ability through uh, node discovery to learn about th those pod subnets of the other nodes and then create routes on the host routing table to get reachability to those uh, other pod siders. Uh, we specify a native routing cider, and so this instructs Cilium. It says, Cilium, when you see traffic uh, within this cider, never um, masquerade the, the source IP, right? And so, um, you know, essentially saying, we don't need to masquerade any of the traffic that goes uh, within, the, uh, within the cluster. Instead of using IP tables for masquerading, we're going to use BPF, and we're also going to replace uh, Kube proxy um, and use Cilium for proxying services. So hey, take a look at it. Cilium is up and running now. And uh, I want to show you something here. Oops. Right, so I, I told you about that uh, auto detection of pod siders from, you know, from other nodes, and here's a perfect example of it, right? So when I go into the control plane node here, uh, I'm looking at the routing table and I see that it, it now has a route to the 244.1 uh, um, subnet or cider, and you see that that 244.1 is actually the pod cider for the worker node um, and vice versa. When I go into the worker node, I see that Cilium has added the pod cider route um, to the control planes pod cider. Okay, now that we've uh, verified that Cilium's uh, up and running, added the host routes, let's go ahead and run um, a sample workload. And this is a, a curl client and a, and an Nginx server that we'll be using for testing connectivity within the cluster. And you see that the client and server pods are running. And uh, in these manifests, I used um, node selectors, an easy mechanism to make sure that the, uh, the client and the server pods are running on different nodes so that when we're testing connectivity, we're actually going between nodes. Um, let's go ahead and do that. Let's actually test connectivity here. And we're going to go ahead and curl from the client to the server. And you see that we got a 200 response. So that's good to go. Um, now let's go ahead and now that we've tested pod to pod connectivity um, across the nodes, I'm going to go ahead and expose uh, the server pod using a Kubernetes service. And you see the service gets assigned a, a V6, but uh, one of the key features that was added to services in Kubernetes for dual stack support are these two fields, the, uh, the family policy as well as the IP families. Uh, so the family policy indicates, will this service get one or more IPs based on the defined IP families? So in our instance, it's a single stack. Server gets a single IP address from the family that we specify, which is IPv6. Um, now let's go ahead and test connectivity through the service. And you see that works as well. So the next thing that we want to go ahead and test here is DNS resolution. So everything that we've been testing so far, great pod, you know, pods on different nodes over a V6 only network, V6 address for pods. All right, great. We've got network connectivity working. But what about DNS? Does DNS work? And so we're going to go ahead and do the same test, but we're going to actually dive into the, the curl request and response in more detail. And you see that. Um, now the curl request is to the DNS uh, name of that 
um, server service, right? And so we're, we're using the well-defined uh, naming structure within Kubernetes of the service name, the uh, namespace of the service dot service. And what you see is kubedns has resolved this name, right? And so kubedns has provided a quad A record uh, uh, to the, the client, and kubedns has, has resolved that name to the service IP. Let's just verify here, right? So this is the service IP. So we see that kubedns has properly resolved the, uh, the DNS name to uh, the uh, IPv6 of the service. And the client goes ahead and issues the request after resolving. You see the, uh, the, the headers that, um, that are added to the HTTP request, and we get a uh, 200 response okay with the payload here. So, so far, so good. Um, next area I wanna talk about is, is Hubble. So we've been looking and testing the network connectivity. Um, Hubble is a platform that is built on top of Cilium and eBPF. Uh, there's been mentions of it in, in some of the talks earlier today, um, but it allows uh, deep observability into the network communications uh, across your Cilium network. And it does this in a very transparent manner since it uses eBPF um, and it's, um, per, you know, it, it doesn't impact the traffic, um, a very minimal impact on the traffic. Uh, so let's go ahead and enable Hubble. And there's also an option uh, if I um, enable the UI as well. Um, but since we're gonna be working from the command line, I'm just enabling um, Hubble. And we can um, see what's going on here. And what's already happened is we've added Hubble Relay to our Cilium installation. And so now we have a Hubble Relay deployment. And let's go ahead and port forward Hubble. And I'm gonna do that so that I can see some of the Hubble activity here uh, when we create uh, some traffic. So let's go ahead and observe traffic from this council and oops, we're wrong. let's jump down here and let's create some traffic that we can observe using Hubble. So the server IP here You see that the request and response was received, 200 okay. And in, in Hubble here, uh, we see a bunch of information now. So each of these lines is, um, is a Hubble observability event, uh, providing a bunch of context to us, right? A timestamp, the source and the destination, you see the details of the source and the destination. Uh, as the namespace and the name of the pods, along with source and destination ports. And what is happening here with two network is that this is being observed as the request goes to the networking stack uh, and it's being forwarded along with the TCP flags, or if it's being sent to an endpoint itself. And so we see the entire uh, communication happening here with Hubble uh, we see that the session gets created, uh, data's passed, and then the session's closed. And if we wanted to with Hubble 2, uh, we can enable the uh, translation false flag and you'll see that we get the same events, but this time instead of displaying the source and destination namespace and pod, uh, we actually get those IPs.
so network policy is, is a, a foundational feature of, of Cilium, right? And it allows us to create network-wide policy for our applications that run in our clusters. And what I want to do to demonstrate network policy is I want to go ahead and create a second client. Let's make sure it's up and running. It is. And let's go ahead and test connectivity from the second client to our server. Great, so we can confirm that from both clients we can access the server, right? But I wanna go ahead and create a network policy here that ensures only uh, the client and not client two can access my server. And what you'll see here uh, with the network policy is that it's using a, a label selector to apply the policy and it's using the labels app server, which are applied, our labels that I have for the server pods show labels. We can verify this, right? So the server has an app server and the clients have their own labels, app client, app client two. So you can see that we can create network policies without ever even having to specify IP addresses. Um, and going back to the, the specification of the network policy, right? So we talked about the endpoint selector being used to attach this policy to endpoints that match these labels. In our case, that's the, the server pod. And then we specify the direction, so it's ingress to that server pod. And then we specify the source, right? Again, using labels. And then the two ports, right? So in English language, right, this is saying uh, traffic from app client to app server uh, ingress on port 80 is allowed, right? So now if we go back and we go to client, let's verify that a client can still access the server, which it can. And now let's do the same thing for client two. And you see it's blocked. But how do we know that it's blocked? Let's go back to our Hubble relay. Um, let me kill that first. And then uh, let's port forward Hubble again. And let's observe the traffic. And let's go ahead and uh, get and then curl. All right, so we're going to go ahead and go from uh, client two to the server, which again, if our network policy is working the way that we expect it, we should actually see, and, and we're actually seeing some of it here already, but let me go ahead and create some space. Let's go down here, and we should see Hubble tell us and there it is, right? And so Hubble is telling us, hey, that packet got forwarded to the network stack, got intercepted by um, the eBPF policy that says deny this traffic, and then it gets dropped. Last but not least, wanted to touch on uh, Big TCP. So Big TCP is a feature that was added to the Linux kernel in 5.19 release. And what it essentially allows uh, the kernel to do is to batch a bunch of either receive or send packets together so that you have a larger payload, becomes more efficient to use the network. So, if you're familiar with something like jumbo frames, similar concept, but the difference with jumbo frames is that you actually need, that, that's a layer two technology. So every, uh, every layer two interface on that path needs to be configured for jumbo frames. Whereas 
big TCP is a feature within the Linux kernel that Cilium is able to take advantage of uh, to increase um, the size of that payload uh, and, again, make the communication over the network much more efficient. So um, let's take a look and see where we're at here. Uh, let me go back to my main console and uh, config a view. So you'll see that it's disabled for v4 and v6. Uh, let's go ahead and enable, or before we enable it, you take a look and we are running a, a, um, a kernel version that will support big TCP. And what we want to do is actually take a look at the nodes and you'll see that the nodes right now have um, a 64K uh, GSO max size, essentially telling us this is the biggest size payload that you can send in a packet. And we're going to go ahead and see using NetPerf um, what kind of performance we get when we run a NetPerf uh, request response test between our client and server uh, across uh, the Cilium network. Okay, you see that they are now up and running. So let's go ahead and run the test really quick. Oops. So while it's running, uh, again, from the net, uh, NetPerf client to the NetPerf server, which is running on this IP address, uh, we're specifying the request response TCP test. We're specifying the request and the response size payloads to be 80,000 kilobytes. And then the output that we want to see is minimum latency P99, P90 latency, uh, along with throughput. So let's go ahead and let's save these results here. All right, so we see minimum latency. So uh, at 71 microseconds, uh, you know, 90% of the request response were uh, handled under 225 microseconds. Uh, 99 percent uh, P99 is 697 and uh, a little over 6,000 transactions per second. Now let's enable big TCP for IPv6 within Cilium. And so when we, enable, when we make this change, we need to um, roll the Cilium daemon set. And while that's happening, let's go ahead. And one of the things we need to do is we need to delete the, uh, the NetPerf client and server in order for um, the larger uh, GSO size to take effect for those pods. We, uh, we actually need to bounce those pods. All right, so Cilium is back up and running. Let's go ahead and kill those pods and recreate them really quickly here. All right, they're back up and running. Now take a look at our uh, GSO max size. It's no longer 64K, it's now at 192K. So let's go ahead and get so wide, um, and let's uh, run the test again because we bounced the client and server. Our server is going to have a new address. And we're still running the, the same test, asking for the same output and the same uh, payload sizes as well. 
So what we see here is we see, we could run it a couple more times and we'll see different results, uh, but just generally a, a nice increase in throughput along with, um, with latency, really across the board improvements. Um, and uh, that gives you a quick introduction to big TCP for IPv6 and just a general introduction of IPv6 uh, for Cilium. So I hope, uh, I hope you enjoyed and, and again, feel free to, um, to, to use this demo uh, if you'd like.